I think we'll just get started. We have enough um, people joined now and we'll just admit more people as they arrive. Um, thank you so much to everyone for joining us. I'm Dr. Melissa Lem. I'm president-elect of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. And welcome to our one hour letter writing party with our friends at the Canadian Association of Nurses for the Environment, Dogwood and Stand Earth to end fossil fuel subsidies in BC. I can't think of a more festive way to start December in the midst of everything that's going on. I wanna acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil nations in Vancouver. And not only am I grateful to the peoples who have stewarded and protected these lands and waters since time immemorial, but I also see it as our duty to learn and work towards righting the wrongs of colonialism that are not only harming the health and self-determination of indigenous peoples, but also our collective health. And that's a really important part of what tonight is all about. Um, I'm assuming that most people here live on the West Coast, but if you don't, I just encourage you, and if, or if you do, I'd encourage you to enter into the chat where you're joining us from today. So as we do that, I'm just going to talk a bit about the structure of tonight, and the whole point is to, to uh, contribute our input to the BC's oil and gas royalty review right now, um, just so that they can make the right decisions about, about where to take, where to take uh, what's happening with fossil fuels in our province. And so we're going to start with a bit of fracking background and health impacts, and that's going to be delivered by Dr. Deborah Curry. Um, Deb, maybe you can put your hand up, or uh, you're, uh, she's a fam Vancouver family physician and active member of the BC Committee of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. And then after Deb's presentation, we're going to have a presentation on the royalty review itself. So Sven Biggs and Alexandra Woodworths, Woodworths will be doing that. Sven is director at Standard and Alexandra is the campaigns manager for Dogwood. Um, so I think I'll, I'll hand it over at this point. And then after, of course, after these presentations, we're uh, going to be um, doing the collective letter writing and breakout groups. So go ahead, Deb. Great. Um, thanks, Melissa. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Okay. So, um, so my name is Dr. Deborah Curry. I'm a subcommittee member of the Natural Gas Committee with BC Cape. And I'm presenting to you from the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil nations. Um, and before I start, I just wanted to do a little check-in. I know it's been a difficult few months for a lot of BC residents with the heat dome, the drought, the wildfires, and now the flooding. Um, and I know a lot of you on this call have been in this movement for a long time. And as a family doctor in this movement, I just want to remind you to take care of yourselves. Um, get outside, eat well and regularly, try to sleep, uh, practice hobbies, do cozy things, and seek out help if you need it. All right, so pressing on. So these are the learning objectives. Um, so we're gonna do a brief overview of fracking, then we're going to learn about the health harms inherent to, to the fracking uh, process for liquefied gas, and then learn about the health harms caused by climate change. So, um, so this is fracking for natural gas in BC. And so we'll focus on natural gas here since this is the majority of what is being extracted in BC. 86% of fracking wells in BC extract uh, natural gas. So natural gas has been extracted in BC since the 1950s and natural gas is 90% methane, which the IPCC report this year confirmed causes 86 uh, per, uh, times the heat trapping effect of carbon dioxide in a 20 year interval. So natural gas is basically methane. Um, and this brings us to the key issue. When natural gas is burned, it creates less carbon than coal, but, carbon, uh, but the carbon reported in the burning of natural gas does not consider um, the methane created in on the fracking wells through flaring, which um, here you can see um, controls the flow back from the wells and through leakage of methane from the wells and from the processing and transport process. So if you take all this into account, uh, natural gas may produce just as much carbon um, as coal. And natural gas production in BC began with conventional uh, vertical drilling for gas close to the surface. But in the 2000s, BC began using horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing or fracking uh, when all the more accessible natural gas had been extracted. And fracking allows the extraction of gas from more solid rock um, deeper in the earth. So fracking injects highly pressurized gallons of water, sand, and a slurry of toxic chemicals, including benzene and toluene, into drilled wells 
um, so you can see right here, um, that can extend several kilometers into the earth. And when the well uh, nears the rock where the natural gas is, the, um, the drilling turns horizontal, so right here, and the pressurized toxic mixture fractures the earth to release gas deposits. And some of the radioactive slurry returns to the surface where it's stored in fracking ponds. Um, so um, this, uh, these fracking ponds can leak and contaminate water tables and in turn drinking water. And abandoned wells are often left behind by the oil and gas industry with no, uh, no cleanup plan. Um, so these are the environmental impacts of fracking. So on air, we have volatile organic compounds, which are released from the open pits that hold the water and chemical brew used for fracking. And there's also high levels of various toxic chemicals, such as radon, hydrocarbons, benzene, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and heavy metals that have been found in fracking wells. On land, the fracking infrastructure uses up key agricultural land, and this is a lot of land in northeastern BC. Um, on water, each fracking well uses 10 million liters of fresh water, that's four Olympic swimming pools um, for each fracking well, and over a thousand different chemicals have been used in um, hydraulic fracturing fluids. They include known or suspected carcinogens, reproductive and developmental toxicants, um, and uh, and other things also. So there are over 35,000 fracking wells scattered across northeastern BC as of um, as of July 2021. And that is equivalent to 143,000 Olympic sized swimming pools worth of toxic radioactive water that threatens local water supplies and more wells are being drilled every day. So natural gas use in BC, after, nat after natural gas is um, produced, it's processed and then pressurized into pipelines for transport and gas uh, for export by sea is chilled into a liquid that travels abroad in LNG tanker ships. And natural gas is used in BC to heat homes, um, for cooking on natural gas stoves and in large vehicles such as ferries and garbage trucks. And it's also used for industrial purposes, for example, in the production of fertilizer, medications, plastic, paint and fabrics. So in summary, um, fracking in BC gives us natural gas, which is 90% methane. Methane escapes during production and transport and methane causes 86 times the heating effect of carbon dioxide causing climate change. And when it reaches its destination, it's burned, which re releases carbon, which causes as climate change and it destroys millions of liters of water annually leaving behind toxic water that leaks into water tables and exposes uh, local residents to radioactive substances. So the public health impacts of LNG. So in 2019 uh, the provincial government in BC, BC published a scientific review on fracking the report concluded that our understanding of fracking's effect on water is lacking and that the government is profoundly ignorant of fracking's possible health risks. Um, they, they did not look into uh, any of the health effects of fracking in this report. And it is CAPE's opinion that the government should um, be collecting royalties from the oil and gas industry to investigate the health harms of fracking and also to account for the health harms caused by the fracking industry and by climate change. And ultimately, of course, there should be a moratorium on new fracking in the province. So the health impacts of fracking. So um, the main one is a risk to pregnancy. Um, so low birth weight, preterm um, births and health defects. So Elise Caron Bedouin has been doing research in Northeastern BC on fracking wells being associated with increased odds of preterm labor and decreased birth weight. And US studies confirm this. And more recently, she found that high levels of some volatile organic compounds such as acetone and chloroform in the tap water and indoor air in the homes of pregnant women living in the Peace River Valley in Northeastern BC. And she says that what we don't have a lot of in the literature is exposure assessment, measuring the level of exposure of local communities to chemicals that are potentially emitted or released during fracking operations. And this is what the BC government has failed to do. And a big challenge of exposure assessment is the logistics and cost. Um, and it costs a lot of money to go to remote areas and have air quality sampling and water quality sampling done. This is being left to universities and professors. And in our opinion, this is the job of the BC government. Pretty much all the information that we have on the health impacts of fracking are from local, uh, reports from local doctors in the areas that are affected and in research done in other jurisdictions, mainly the US. 
Um, so higher incidence of uh, glioblastomas is another one. This is a brain tumor. Um, a radiologist in Dawson Creek reported seeing twice the normal incidence of glioblastoma in his time there as a physician. Um, and there are no studies on glioblastoma in BC, but research suggests an environmental link between benzene and brain cancer and other types of cancers. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, an internist diagnosed 10 cases in the two years that he worked in Dawson Creek. And after moving to Surrey in the several months he was there, he had yet to see this disease. We rarely see cases of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis in general practice and risk factors are smoking, radiation and inhaled pollutant exposure. Asthma attacks, a study in Pennsylvania found a positive association between the degree of fracking activity near a patient's home and mild, moderate, and severe asthma exacerbations. Nosebleeds are well-documented side effects um, of increased levels of VOCs in the air, which are released during fracking. Sinus problems, headaches, and fatigue are seen in US studies. Leukemia, there's evidence which suggests that fracking may increase the risk of acute lymphocytic leukemia among children whose mothers live near oil and gas wells during pregnancy, and then mental health issues such as depression and anxiety in people who live in the area. Um, the impact of LNG on Indigenous communities. So um, we see that um, water scarcity, uh, of course, is, occurs due to excessive use by the fracking industry. Um, contaminated, contaminated tailing ponds where wildlife drink affect um, local Indigenous populations and unlawful use of unceded ter uh, Indigenous territories such as the Wet'suwet'en. And Indigenous women um, are at greater, greater risk of sexual assaults and substance misuse as a result of temporary working camps. Um, and then we move to um, down the line when uh, gas is used. So the impact of gas appliance use. So cooking with gas re uh, releases um, nitrogen dioxide into the home uh, and studies show that this creates an increase in asthma attacks in children and approximately 1 million homes in BC are fueled by fracked gas. Alternatives exist such as heat pumps, induction stoves and electric water heaters. And then of course the health impacts of climate change. So direct impacts of climate change, we see trauma, displacement and deaths associated with floods, storms and wildfires and via heat related illness. We see indirect impacts, so this is mediated by uh, natural systems. Um, so air pollution, um, this uh, air pollution of course can cause um, uh, increased uh, risk for certain illnesses. Um, wildfires can cause increased heart, lung and kidney disease. Um, UV radiation increases um, certain types of cancer, and then food and waterborne uh, infectious disease and vector-borne uh, disease. And then uh, mediated by human systems, of course, with climate change, we've seen recently livelihoods and poverty. Um, uh, it can cause livelihoods to be lost and, and poverty, and then migration and displacement as well as, well as conflict. Um, and then the BC health impact. So of course, uh, we've seen very personally in BC in the past few months that the wildfires flooding, with the wildfires flooding drought and heat domes, um, and doctors in the lower mainland saw their elderly and vulnerable patients succumb to heat dome caused um, heat exposure and death. Doctors across the province saw wildfire smoke worsening heart and lung disease and mental health, and drought has devastated the livelihoods across livelihoods across the country, as have recent floods. Um, and all of this is affecting mental health. So I'm asking all of you to think about how fracking and climate change affects your health and the health of your patient, uh, of your friends and family in this province, and to tell the province that we don't want to fund the fracking industry anymore, and we want to make it much harder for them to do business. And keep in mind that we, the residents of BC, own the fossil fuels in BC, and according to the government, we have a right to have a say in how they are utilized. Also keep in mind that to keep warming below 1.5 degrees, we have to have emissions in nine years. This means using every means necessary to decrease emissions, including ensuring royalties reflect climate change costs. The independent assessment for this royalty review done by two professors of economics says that the choice of royalty rate and any royalty credits is a decision about appropriate share of the value of the resource between companies and the government and they represent us. 
We cannot discuss value without discussing the human and environmental health costs of fracking for LNG and the societal costs of climate change. And Premier Horgan has been talking about removing inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, but in our mind, all, all fossil fuel subsidies are inefficient since they distort the market and make it easier for companies to pollute. So we at CAPE are arguing that we must stop all fossil fuel subsidies in the royalty framework as they let fossil fuel companies worsen climate change. And we are arguing that the uh, royalty rate fossil fuel companies pay to the government must increase to reflect the health harms of fracking and the health devastation of climate change. And in the end, this has to lead to an end to all fossil fuel exploration in BC. Thanks for your attention and that's it. Thanks so much, Deborah. And I think we're going to head over to um, Sven and Alexandra now to, to talk about the royalty review specifically. Hi, everyone. I'll say hi while Sven's getting the slideshow up. I'm Alexandra Woodsworth. I'm campaigns manager at Dogwood, and I'm calling in from Shishal and Squamish territory on the Sunshine Coast. Thanks so much for having us, and thank you, Deb, for that um, yeah super inspiring overview to get us started. Um, Sven, say hi. <laughs> Hey everybody, uh, my name is Sven Biggs. I'm joining you from the unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And I am the Canadian Oil and Gas Program Director at Stand on Earth. Um, this quote is from the, the expert report that, uh, that was mentioned. Um, and it kind of sums up everything uh, about what's going on with this royalty review. The current system is broken and it has been growing out of control. So um, in 2019, the International Institute for Sustainable De Development flagged for us in a, a report that BC had the second highest fossil fuel subsidies of any province, second only to Alberta. And uh, so we started to look into it. We hired an economist who went through the provincial budget line by line using the um, the World Trade Organization's definition of a subsidy to identify fossil fuel subsidies. And what we found this year was that $1.3 billion was going uh, from the province to subsidize fossil fuels. And when you compare that to what we were earning from fossil fuel subsidies through royalties, which was only $282 million, there was a stark contrast. You can also see here on the, the right of your screen, how this has ramped up dramatically over time. Um, the reason for this big increase is largely because fracking companies in particular have figured out how to abuse the royalty system. Um, in the early 2000s, the Campbell Liberals brought in something called the Deep Well Royalty Credit. Um, deep Well is just a fancy word of saying fracking because they counted both uh, how deep the wells went sideways as well as down. And that allowed them to kind of kickstart the fracking industry here in BC. What the expert report found that as time went on, fracking companies stopped drilling the most profitable wells and started drilling the wells that would generate the most subsidies. And that is why, uh, as you can see here in this graph, um, this shows the blue, red and blue bars are the revenue that our province has earned through royalties and fees from, from the oil and gas industry. And the green line there is the production of oil and gas. So we see that um, the revenues that are coming into provincial coffers have dropped off dramatically and are almost non-existent now, while production has continued to ramp up. And this kind of inverse curve here um, explains in a lot of ways what the companies have been able to get away with and why this royalty review is so important right now. The reality is, is that many of the wells in this province aren't viable without public money. Alex? Yeah, so I think um, Deborah covered a little bit of this, but obviously, you know, we're living through this moment right now that makes it incredibly clear as this photo shows um, the reasons why we need to keep fossil fuels in the ground. But obviously, if the already approved LNG plants get built out as planned, um, this fracking boom will be unleashed. That will make it impossible to meet our, our climate targets. 
And we're funding this, you know, funding climate destruction, funding this expanded industry um, with these billions of dollars of public money. And that really the industry needs, right? The, the kind of economics are so marginal that without um, these subsidies, the ability to expand in this way is really quite questionable and that, you know, the discussion paper actually lays this out really clearly so talking about how some of these credit programs are specifically designed to encourage production beyond what the market would bear, essentially. Um, so the other piece here, of course, is that they send the exact opposite signal um, to the carbon tax, which, you know, the government has laid out really clearly as a very core part of its, of its climate plan. So with one hand, um, you know, the government is asking companies to pay to pollute, and with the other hand, they are, are paying them to pollute. Uh, so that's obviously distorting, distorting things um, in a kind of crazy way when you think about it. Um, and also really unfairly tilting the scales in favor of fossil fuel companies when we need to be all in on developing renewables. So really, you know, putting a finger on the scale of what kind of, of energy gets, gets to be developed and gets to be more, more competitive. Um, because obviously every public dollar that is, um, you know, handed out to the fossil fuel sector is one that's not available for, for other things, um, whether that's clean energy or all the other urgent public spending priorities like healthcare and housing and reconstruction after these floods. Um, it is worth noting um, that that 1.3 billion number that, that Sven highlighted is, is significantly more in, in taxpayer handouts as well than is spent on the climate change program, on BC's climate program. So that, again, is just this script that we need to absolutely flip in the opposite direction. Um, and yeah, the way I think of it is we're in 2021, we're in the middle of this climate emergency and the very basic, like the baseline for climate action, the baseline to be considered uh, to be a climate leader, to be on the right pathway is to, um, you know, stop pumping public money into the industry that's fueling the crisis uh, and take that money and put it into clean energy and, uh, and a just transition. So in case it wasn't clear, Sven and I are doing a little two-hander here. I think that's what they call it in the, in the theatrical world. And we're gonna jump back and forth through a few pieces as we talk you through, um, yeah, what's at stake and what we wanna see in the, in the royalty review. So back to you, Sven. Okay. Um... So we've talked a little bit about what's wrong with the existing system, and uh, we, we should stop and take a second to talk about what could be wrong with the proposed system. Uh, so the discussion paper that the government uh, released when they started this consultation process, it lays out a couple of options for what a new royalty system is going to look like. One of the, the options that seems to be their preference uh, involves something called capital cost recovery for the oil and fracking companies, which would basically allow uh, these fossil fuel companies to take the cost of drilling wells off the top of the royalties and could potentially uh, keep them from paying any royalties into the system. Basically, what the province is potentially attempting to do here is replace an old fossil fuel subsidy with a new fossil fuel subsidy. So that's uh, why we need to, to get involved in this process and push for a flat fee with no capital cost recovery. The other thing we need to do is to make this prob this new program or, or new royalty system um, have the future in mind. It's been 30 years since we did a whole scale review of, of the royalty system in BC. And that's kind of partly why things got so out of control with royalty credits because nobody was really watching the, the, uh, the till. Um, so we need to future-proof this new system. And obviously climate change is one of the big challenges we're gonna face. So we, th we think that one, uh, it, the new rates should reflect the social and environmental costs that the oil and gas industry is offloading onto the public currently. And then two, that they should rise over time to help uh, reduce the impacts of climate change and to eventually help us phase out this industry because we know in the long term this isn't part of our climate plan. Okay, back to you, Alex. So, our, our you know, what we have four core asks uh, in terms of what we're suggesting folks um, call for in their submissions, and, and number three here is around respecting Indigenous rights. And obviously, I'm sure. Um, Almost everyone in this call has been following what's been happening in the Tsotan territory in the last few weeks, and obviously for much longer than that, decades and, and centuries, as a matter of fact, it's the outcome of, of colonialism. 
but um, very clearly what's been going on the last couple of weeks, what happens when, uh, when resource projects proceed without Indigenous uh, consent. Um, so this piece here obviously is around um, what you're seeing is a photo here the day that the um, BC DRIPA Act, the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People Act was uh, passed. And what that calls for under law really is to develop new laws and policies um, you know, in consultation with, with Indigenous people. So that's, that's what we're asking for here is for the government to follow that, that principle that they've outlined for themselves um, and make sure that the new royalty review uh, royalty system is developed in full partnership with traditional and elected uh, Indigenous governments whose territories are impacted at the full uh, supply chain from the point of extraction and the shipping routes and the export routes. Um, and kind of, you know, a, a secondary piece to all of this is, you know, you, you know, what royalties are, are fees that are paid uh, to the Crown for a resource claimed by the Crown. So um, a second piece of all this is really that there should be um, what we call revenue sharing, essentially, um, you know, whatever money is coming in, there should be some concept of sharing that with the, the Indigenous nations whose, whose territories are, are affected. And our number three is around water. As Deborah mentioned, obviously, um, huge amounts of water are consumed by this industry. Um, and when I say consumed, I mean polluted, right? We've got uh, about 27 billion liters of fresh water every year is sucked out and um, you know, added this, this toxic brew of chemicals. And um, once it's used, it's so polluted, it can't be treated or put back into the, into the water cycle. So it's disposed of and lost from, from the environment, from the water cycle forever. Um, and under some pretty wildly outdated regulations, along with the royalty system itself, um, there is no very, very, very little amount of money is being paid by these companies to use this, this amount of water. In fact, less than the cost of uh, a pint of beer around five dollars for every Olympic swimming pool worth of water. So we're essentially giving our water away for for free or for very, very little money. And it's time to end that um, that free ride by setting rates again that are high enough to account for the, the water that is is being polluted through this industry. Um, so one of the other important things uh, that this royalty review is considering is how we make the, the move from the current system, the current broken system to the new system. And um, this is a pretty critical piece because uh, other jurisdictions like Alberta that went through a royalty review under the Notley government in 2017, they locked in their wells uh, under that old system for 10 years, meaning that there are still wells in, in Alberta that are not paying the new, the new royalty rate. And uh, the authors of the expert paper suggested we should follow Alberta's lead when it comes to transition. But obviously we can't allow um, these, the, these producers to run up more and more uh, royalty credits. One of the things we haven't talked about is that in fact, um, the, because we hand out so many royalty credits in BC, the companies are accumulating kind of credits that they roll over year to year. And they've now built up $3.1 billion worth of unused royalty credits. So an important question in this process is what to do with those outstanding credits. Obviously, um, because these companies have so blatantly manipulated the system in their favor, we don't think that it would be fair for the taxpayers of British Columbia to basically have to eat this whole uh, massive pile of credits. And we're, we want folks to urge uh, the, the government to, to find a way to walk away from as much as possible of, of this outstanding debt. So I like this photo because it's got a bunch of uh, familiar faces in it. There's Dr. Lem um, and uh, Dali, who is a Wet'suwet'en rights advocate and uh, my colleague from Dogwood. And there's Ben Parfit, who's the expert on water. So it kind of brings it all together when we were um, at the ledge a couple months ago uh, on the first day of the, uh, of the fall session. And just a little bit in terms of, you know, the political context here. 
I do think we have a shot with this review. I mean, obviously, this is a, you know, there are political realities here. We can, you know, we need to, to do as many submissions as we can. And we also need to know what's going on in, in the real world. But I think in this case, we really do have a shot at ending some of the um, sort of big ticket subsidies that are embedded in the system, the deep well royalty credit being one of them. Um, you know, this review grew out of a lot of movement pressure and turned into a campaign promise in the, in the fall election. I think the BCNDP knows they've got a problem on their hands with, um, with some of these kind of most egregious handouts. You know, the premier's on record saying he wants the new system to eliminate uh, inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. So I think they know it's a problem. They know, you know that, that folks are watching and expecting something coming out of here. Uh, inefficient is kind of a weasel word that we all need to watch out for. Um, I think what that could mean is getting rid of some of the handouts, but continuing to pay companies to clean up their mess rather, rather than using regulation for that to do so. Um, and of course, you know, if we see an end to some of the subsidies, but set rates at kind of such low prices that can, you know companies are continued to be incentivized to, you know, frack more and more, that doesn't put us, you know, all that far ahead. So there are certainly things to watch out for here. And probably, you know, in the biggest, uh, you know, the biggest one there is how hard industry is going to be pushing back in terms of trying to hang on to these deals that they've been getting used to for so long. Um, and that, of course, is um, what calls on us to make sure that not just us, everyone in this call tonight, but all, all the folks we can ask to, to, to make a submission as well, really speak out, um, make it clear that we're seeing this as a, a litmus test for the NDP's commitment on climate change. Um, you know, this is a sensitive time for them. Clean BC update came out about a month ago and they kind of got slammed for failing to tackle the oil and gas piece of all of this. Um, so I think it comes at a critical political moment. And I think um, seeing folks on calls like this is really inspiring. Um, and yeah, really encourage you to make sure you do everything you can to get other folks uh, joining in as well so that we can kind of drown out the opponents who we know are pushing, pushing back really hard. Um, and just on that last note, what you know, just in terms of what we're calling for, we've covered these four key points today. Um, the government asks a bunch of super technical questions, some of which you know Sven covered in some of those points. But I, I think from my perspective, having done this for a long time, encourage lots of folks to make submissions. What matters most is that you write it from the heart, that you make a personal submission, and you say what you think needs to be said. Don't let them box you into their technical questions if those aren't the ones you want to talk about. Um, what has impact is uh, is personal submissions and um, yeah, making sure that we we cover the things that we think they need to hear, not only answering the questions they want to hear, because um, that's our job as citizens is to make sure we make our voices heard and um, and tell the government what they need to hear. So I think that's it from both of us. Thank you so much for having us on the call tonight, and I will hand it back to Dr. Lim, I believe. Thank you so. Alex and Sven, that was super illuminating and nice and brief, but I'll which is the reason you're all here, right? Is to is to write letters, um, write individual customized letters, as Alex said, that have more impact than than kind of form letters or or filling out a led by a key member of our Cape and Kane's unnatural gas campaign. Um, so if you just want to put up your hands, the moderators here, we have um, Helen Boyd from Kane. We have Dr. Larry Barzilai. Um, we've got Dr. Kevin Liang, who is actually the mastermind kind of behind this whole event, who came up with the idea. So thank you, Dr. Liang. We've got um, Dr. Deborah Curry. You've already met um, Dr. Maura Brown. And I think, I don't think I'm missing anyone. Um, and oh, Dr. Warren Bell, I don't know where he went. <laughs> He's around there somewhere. So um, I'm going to ask Kevin to put the link, uh, the, to put the link to um, the letter writing template into the chat. So uh, we can all have access to it. And then we're gonna head off and start writing. Just give me one second here. I am assigning the rooms as we speak. I'm almost done here. Okay. I think we're good. Okay, I will open the rooms and then here we go. Is it working for folks?
Yeah, so I think we have to choose, we have to find our name actually and choose which room to join. So. Kevin, have you assigned me to a room? Oh, I did not. I don't, <laughs> I, don't I, I couldn't find your name. Oh. I should have my own room. Are, aren't there supposed to be seven? I, I made six because I, I wanted to like be in the background just in case something goes wrong. So I oh, okay, six, sure. So six, I, yeah. Okay, I might be by myself in, in a room. I don't know if you um, I don't know if you can kick other people to to my room or something. Room six, or whoever's here right now. I guess we'll have yeah, like we a could, small we, group. We, yeah, we could do this. This room. is our own room. Okay, awesome. Great. Um, hi, Martha and, and Josephine. And Shirley and Nancy, thank you so much for joining. Um, so I think we're going to, so the link, if you could just click on the link that Kevin put in the chat, if you can see it, it'll take us to the letter writing template. And there's a lot of information on it, but we'll try to make it easy. Um, has everyone, oops, has everyone clicked on the link? <laughs> Josephine, did you manage to to uh, to open up the Google document? <laughs> hmm. Um. <laughs> you and I can just chat, Kevin. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I, it's, I, I can't see you on the list of names because I think as a host, I actually can't assign you. Oh, to a I see. Yeah, okay. I anyway, think, whatever. Uh, what I can do is, like, you could just join one of the rooms, like, um, or you could just join room six and I can move people to room six. Oh, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. We can just, uh, <laughs> can we can we assign the people who are currently in this room to, to other rooms? I've already assigned them because they haven't accepted it. I think they're, oh, they haven't I don't gone. Know, yeah, I don't know if they're actually there. Um, but let me just take, Deborah has a room. Helen has a room. Larry okay. has a room. Maura yeah. has a room. And Warren has a room. Oh, Adrian Brown is joining us. Maybe we can write a letter with. <laughs> <laughs> Two unassigned participants. Oh, Adrian and Kevin. <laughs> okay. Adrian, hello. Are you there? I wonder if she got kicked off and then just auto rejoined. Are you, who oh, are you hello? talking? Hi. Adrian. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh, something happened. It froze up. So, and so anyway. Um, oh, okay. Which, um, were you already in a room and you were, you were um, kicked out or are you just jo joining back again? No. Well, I don't know what happened. I didn't even get to a room. Something happened. The whole thing just froze and, uh, a while ago, so I ended up going out and coming in again. Okay. Did you want to write a letter? Yeah. <laughs> but I missed a whole bunch. So Yeah, I, that's I okay. Really... We'll take we'll take you through it. So I think we might have to post the uh the link chat again so that Adrian can see it. Adrian, did you want to click on that link? That'll take oh. you to the letter writing template. Kevin just put it into the chat. Okay. Writing template again. Okay. And the nice thing is, even if we run out of time, you can always revisit it later and and, uh, and use the template on your own. Okay, great. Thanks. Josephine, are you planning to write a letter as well? Um, I'm not sure if you're talking or you you might be muted. Anyway, I can't, I can't tell. We'll just, uh, Adrian, did you manage to, to uh, open up the template? 
Yeah, I did. Okay, perfect. Okay. And did you want to open up like a document or like an email so you can start writing? Uh, yeah. I'm not sure how to do that. Have you sent an email before? I'm sure you have. Oh, yeah, but I so have like you... done it like with all this stuff on my screen too, so. Oh, okay, okay. If you, do you have like a word processor on your computer? I don't think so. I'm not very technical at all, so. I'll just okay, okay. Um, can write it and I can perfect. put it in later, yeah. That's perfect, okay. Um, all right, so there are some very, so there are some key components that have to, that the government is asking um, be in this letter. So I know you missed Alexandra Woodsworth from uh, a Dogwood saying that we can kind of customize it to what we want. But the first part is stating your name and town or city of residence. So you just, um, you know, say my name is right. Adrian yeah. Brown and I live in wherever. Where are you joining us from? I'm in Chimanis, um, uh, Vancouver Island. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. It's like lots of mystery noises. <laughs> like, what's happening there? Are you finding some paper on a pen, Adrian? Oh yeah, I've got that, but I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I don't do these things very well. Oh, it's I'm okay. trying to get. I don't know how to get it to move up and down properly. Oh. Okay. Um. So, so there's like a scroll bar on the right hand side that you should be able to see of the of the um, yeah I see that window. but it doesn't I never can get it to work very well and I then left and click and then try to move it and try to drag it it doesn't move hey well it it jumps all over the place okay engage submission guidelines okay I'm just writing this down and you can always um Adrian you can always open it later like have this keep this document open on your um web browser and then just on your own time later if it's too much you know to, to get through it now you can use it as a template to write you can even print it if you have a printer at home i don't have a printer okay i'm not technical at all <laughs> yeah that's okay something else that you can do too um if you're having trouble with scrolling on the right hand side is uh just just click on in the text like of the actual document and then just use your arrow keys to go up and down. Oh, so I could just click over here. Mm -hmm. And then. And then. Oh, you there. Know, so okay. Down. Yeah. So it doesn't jump over the oh, place. That, that works way better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So you start. Um, so you start with the letter just by saying who you are and where you live. So you're Adrian right. Brown from Shamanus. Okay. Yeah. Did you finish writing that? Uh, yeah, but I'm looking at this state. Your knowledge level of knowledge and involvement in the natural gas industry, if you don't know a lot. Hmm, I'm not exactly sure what to say. Yeah, so have you have you worked for the natural gas industry or do you know about it? Or, or no, do you, I don't. Have you I, about it? I, mean, I just know what the kind of stuff you've been talking about. Right, You know, right. fracking and chemicals and, you know, like groundwater destruction mm -hmm. and tailing the, the pond. 
ponds that are killing birds and you know yeah just it's horrible how long have you been aware of it like how many years adrian how long have you been aware of the issue like how many years have you known about it um i'm not exactly sure because that's something you could say is like i've been following information about the you know fracking right. hydraulic fracturing industry for a certain period yeah. of time right Right, okay. And then indicate, uh, um, and you know, like like uh, this point says, and I understand that it's important to stop fossil fuel subsidies yeah. and increase royalties to protect the environment. Kevin, you can feel free to, to, to jump in too if you wanna if you want to help. You're probably keeping an eye on the rooms or something. Yeah, no, it, I'm yeah, I I guess we're learning as we go to I can't even assign myself to a room too. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> I have to unhost you or something. Yeah. It's like yeah. Something we learn as we go. Yeah. <laughs> How are you doing there, Adrian? Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, are you ready for the next part? And the next part is basically just saying, talking about why this issue is so important to you. Um, and why is it important to you? Like what brought you here tonight? Uh, Cause I think we should stop fracking altogether. It's just, uh, I mean, when you see those images of all the wells that there are in Northeastern BC and uh, yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's just it's, it's just a nightmare mm -hmm. and so has like for example um what's your background so, like are you working or retired i'm re i'm a retired early childhood uh, early childhood educator mm -hmm. so i think that could be a, like a really compelling opening as you've worked with children you know you're, you're concerned about children's future and you've you know you've been really disturbed by by the what you've seen and what you've heard about what's happening in in the right. east just something that personalizes it basically. You could say that you, you know, you are a retired um, by then. Um, and so, uh, and so in terms of where to send it, I, I'll get uh, Kevin to put in the chat where to email and where to send and where to send it via snail mail. But again, that's all in the template. And then I just encourage you, if you have friends or family or colleagues who you think might be interested in using our template to craft a, a letter, feel free to share it. Um, the link is there. And I think what we'll do afterwards is maybe email the link out to everyone who signed up for the webinar so they can um, access it and use it later. And there are also some letter writing tools if, if, uh, if you wanna share those, if your, your friends or colleagues um, don't wanna spend the time writing their personalized letter, Dogwood and Standard have letter writing tools. And I'll just get Kevin to put that in the chat as well. Um, in terms of who you write it to, I would just put to, to, you know, the oil and gas royalty review. It doesn't, it's not just a specific person. It's just kind of like a general letter to, to your question there, Linda. And another way, exactly, another way um, in the chat, you can take action on this file is making phone calls. So Dogwood has this really great um, kind of phone calling tool that you can use to send messages, leave messages directly with MLAs. And then finally, um, donating is one way that you can keep supporting the work that, that CAPE does. Um, there are two links there, one to donate to CAPE and one to donate to the Wet'suwet'en to help with their resistance against fossil fuels. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. And I think one thing that we wanted to do, if everyone's okay with it, is take a photo of everyone who attended just to show how much interest there is in people um, ending fossil fuel subsidies in Canada or in Canada, in BC and Canada, right? So um, yeah, I'll just get everyone to give us a wave and then we'll take a photo. Great, thank you so much. Does anyone have any final questions or comments? Just one quick, quick, quick question, Melissa, did you get both screens? Because there's two screens of us. Sure, you, you, know, you know what I'm gonna have to do? Um, Slide it over to the- Yeah, Kevin, do you think you could take the second screenshot? <laughs> yeah, this is so I did it. Great. Okay. It's a nice I have problem. To... I know, too many people, this is so great. 
Okay, well, um, happy December, everyone. And I hope that was useful. And again, refer to our template if you're not done yet and share it widely. Um, we wanna make as much impact as we, as we can. And I think all these personal heartfelt letters are, are, are what hopefully will move the government as they do this review. And so, so, so where do we go from here send me the for more information I on, on, on the royalty review or on how to send well, it? Uh, on the letter. Uh, yeah, so all the details. Right. We'll email out the template again to everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And and oh, thank you. Yeah. So you'll have access to this and you can share it widely. This thank you. You, I You're think welcome. someone mentioned making a copy to our MLA. That's what I would like to do. Do a carbon copy to my MLA of the letter. Do you, don't you think that would be good? We That's need a great to idea. Be, um, especially my MLA is an NDP member. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.